Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how goes it today? Uh, it is going very well with me. How is it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. Uh, the best way to do that is to follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at, at Focused Compound. Uh, if you would like to get access to investment write up from Jeff going all the way back to 2005, go to focusedcompounding.com and you'll get all of that for free at our website. All the information is in the description below. So, in today's podcast, Jeff, we are going to be going over a question. Um, and uh, if you're listening and you would like to send in questions, email them to me at andrewatfocusedcompounding.com. Uh, in the subject line, just put question for the podcast or something and we'll queue it and we will pull it for the podcast. So this question says, when it comes to valuing a business, do you believe more in asset valuations or earnings? Earnings aren't guaranteed to be there in the future, depending on the industry, of course, but assets are only worth what you can sell them to somebody else. Do you think a pizza shop should be analyzed based on how much pizza they sell or the value of its real estate and bank account? Should they all be assessed when determining a value for the business? This is the question I've been thinking about in trying to understand valuation. So we could run with that, get your thoughts on that. Sure. I don't know if there's a difference in companies or how you think about it, but yeah, let's go from there. So asset valuation so, versus earnings valuation. Right. So here, I think that this is a great question, but it's also a, it, it's a great, great question, but it's also a really dumb idea, which is that you would value something one way or the other. I wrote a blog post a long time ago about assets, earnings, equivalents. And one of my points about that was, ultimately, if you're appraising things correctly, you should be able to convert one side of a company um, entirely into the other in the sense that you should either be able to come up with a with a um, estimate of what the market value of everything would be, um, or you should be able to come up with an estimate of what all the earnings would be if everything was put to, say, its highest and best use or something like that. So this comes up all the time in, in banks, insurance companies, et cetera, where interest rates were near zero, you would say, okay, well, let's take the balance sheet and let's apply different rates to it that it will earn more in the future. So you convert those assets into earnings. This is the biggest problem with Berkshire. People want to do it one calculation or the other. They're both really the same thing. You know, assets are things that produce earnings and earnings really turn into retained earnings. They can be paid out or other things, but they just turn back into those assets in terms of that's the form that they take. And I tried to mention that way in terms of like, you know, with physics, you know, um, the same idea in terms of the equivalence there. I wanted to give that same idea with earnings and assets. And I think it's really dangerous for people to focus on them as one or the other through time they're the same thing, right? You can take earnings and turn them into assets. You can take assets and turn them into earnings. You can either take the earn the assets and make them more productive in everything they generate earnings, or you can sell them, invest them in other things that have earnings, right? So in the case of some companies, it may be that you know that they're stuck in a mindset that is going to be harmful to the company over time because they have other concerns besides you know, financial ones, and maybe it's a family run thing, maybe it's, this thing's been around forever, and they're stuck in this industry that will never get better, whatever, and they won't follow a path that would be the highest and best use of the things that you see there with the assets, then you could say, okay, well, then I have to value it based only on these meager earnings that it has. And uh, it'll never sell. But usually, even then it does sell, you know, someone will die, it will sell one day. So there's three ways to look at a business, right? You can look at what the assets look like right now, and you can change them to their market value and everything. That's sort of the Marty Whitman way of doing it. You can look at the earnings and say, okay, these are the current earnings, and I'll use that as it. Or you can use the basically the net present value of the future cash flows, which assumes all the capital allocation decisions the company makes and all that. Of all the ways, so this is sort of a triangle, and using this, you can kind of triangulate for value. The most the most important one to know is the NPV. It's also the one you have the least confidence in. The hardest. And has the most uncertainty. Yeah, but it's by far the most important. The second most important is the earnings, which also is less certain, even in terms of the way that people just take reported earnings as if they mean something. But even in terms of you have to go through the earnings and adjust them for all sorts of things to get an idea of what earnings really are. Earnings are actually quite more complicated concept than assets or cash flows usually at a company. Um, they're much easier to, to, to um, they have a high subjective element and timing element to them. And then um, assets is the one you would be most 
um, able to come up with a number for it, but it is the number that would mean the least. So that's the problem that you have. The one you can have the most confidence in today is what it looks like, is what the assets look like, what they could be liquidated for, et cetera, today. But it's the least important number to know usually. And then the one that's by far the most important is the NPV number, right? So if you're looking at Berkshire Hathaway when Buffett takes over, you know the asset number very well. It's actually kind of inaccurate in that it would turn out that you wouldn't be able to liquidate it as well as you had hoped or any of those things. But you have confidence that it's not too expensive. But the number that you really need to know that this company is going to do 20%, 30% a year for, for decades is to know that NPV number, but that depends on capital allocation and what they do with everything, which is much trickier for people to figure out and includes things above the business level and really what the, the corporation is doing and how they approach things. So you use all three of those things to try to see what could be the case. And I always use all three of those, always when looking at companies. Mm -hmm. um, but... You then have the question of like margin of safety and how certain are you of some things happening. And sometimes it also creates a difference in terms of valuations and maybe how quickly people recognize things in the market and whether you should invest in something or not. So if you take an example like NACO, I would have invested that on the basis of the idea that you're going to have earnings over time and that will either turn into assets or as we said, like an MPV type thing. To a large extent, I was not off on any of those estimates over five, six, seven years, whatever. So it has followed since the spinoff much the same path that I would have expected in terms of what it's generated and how those things have kind of ossified on the balance sheet and everything. So now it looks cheaper on like an asset basis, whereas when it started, it didn't look cheap on an asset basis. So it, it migrated from that perspective from being something that maybe looked cheap if you read the contracts and tried to understand the business to something that now looks cheap on stuff like price to tangible book. But all of those things that you see there came from buildup. In some cases, there was contract terminations, and they got things from that. In some cases, they actually, you know, um, minerals were used up over time. You know, natural gas was brought out of the ground and sold and everything, and they collected um, their royalties on that, and that turned into cash. And in other cases, just earnings that piled up on the balance sheet because they have some dividends, and they've only recently started buying back. But it followed the path that I would expect from the time of the, the spinoff. Um, and... Yet at times, some people would focus, there, there's different people who send things in and they would say, oh, well, here's on the cash flow thing, why I like it or why I don't. And then they change at different times whether they like the stock or not. Then there's other people who say, well, on the balance sheet, it's not cheap enough at first, right? Because there's these contracts that, that don't have the same value in terms of what you're seeing versus, say, cash just sitting there on the balance sheet. But it also has, has dumb things on the balance sheet, too, and they've written some of those off. But they just have, like, you know, loads of coal inventory in places that probably, you know, you couldn't be so sure that they would ever get used. And they're counting that as if that's an asset that's good, but they're maybe not paying as much attention to the fact you have a contract that as long as this plant keeps operating, you're going to keep making money. Now, the plant could shut down any day, but the coal could be worthless any day, too. Um, so you want things that are... Um, attractive in the way that you look at them. But you do have to be aware that most people are not going to take that kind of view of all the different ways you can value a company, assets, earnings, and this MPV type thinking. Some people, your growth type investors, um, VC, whatever type people who think of the NVIDIAs and stuff today are only looking at the MPV type stuff. They don't care what the earnings are today or what the assets are. Then you have your hard Ben Graham types, which might be looking at the assets, even in cases where that doesn't necessarily make much sense because we know things about the future. Um, and there are some cases where this becomes dramatically different. The big ones are in cases of like insurance and banking. I side with Buffett on that. I'm very happy to buy a bank at two times tangible book or more without any hesitation if I like the, the, the actual value of the bank that way. And yet I also won't buy other banks as 0 0.9 times tangible book because some banks have, a, and, and insurance companies, but some of them have a real business with a real franchise to it that's based on relationships that they have and you know lower cost deposits than others and advantages in different ways on fee businesses, whatever. But it's a, it's a service business that way that actually has a lot of built up goodwill in it. And then others basically are paying competitive savings rate type things. And then like, you know, investing in the equivalent of just what would be like a portfolio of mortgages or something. You know what I mean? That, what they say they do might be a little different from that, but it's awfully close to commodity on this side, commodity on that side. And so that business might be something that earns 6% return on equity at a very reasonable leverage ratio. And someone else earns 20%. And, and it's, it's not a risk-based thing. It's that there's real um, economic assets that aren't captured on the books in one case and not in the other. 
Um, it would be more noticeable if you were buying something that was started out from scratch that way. If it acquired its way to all that, then there'd be intangibles and the things that you could look at that would look different. But it becomes especially different that way. So it's the same as like with C's, you know? There's nothing wrong with paying a high price for something um, on an asset basis. So I have no problem that way uh, of something that has no... I've invested in companies that have essentially negative uh, equity, probably. I literally, I don't remember if IMS Health had negative equity when I invested in it, but it probably may have. It was buying back stock. So it probably had no tangible equity, no no book value. Mm -hmm. What do you think generates better returns in the short to medium to long term? Buying on the balance sheet, selling on the earnings, or buying based on a cheap earnings multiple? Well, I, I think the thing that tends to make money is something where the effect is really, really big. So I don't think that you make a lot of money in earnings or assets or any of those by buying at things that are close to the uh, amount that it actually is worth, right? So when people say, does assets work better than, than earnings or something, with a lot of people thinking today that assets don't work as well, I would disagree with that. I think that assets work really well if there's a huge discount, right? So I still think that they would work in a really big way if you're getting a huge discount. I think that people tend to be overly aggressive in write-ups on the asset portion of it. Um, a good thing, we talked about the movie business. And one thing to keep in mind with that, because this applies to investing here, is if you have movies that you're now making and putting out not in theaters, but just to streaming and all that, you could make small amounts of money on everything you make. You could have a well-controlled budget. You know what you're going to get paid for putting on these different services, whatever. But you don't have any possibility for these big windfall profits from a surprise run in theaters. There's not much of a cap on how much you could make if you happen to have something that everyone loves. And if you don't have that, then you can't make this huge upside. What I think the problem is with many of these asset things that I see in write-ups is there's not enough upside, to be honest. So you may be able to prove that there is some strong protection on the downside, right? Or that it's at 80%. But I don't think you want to buy something at 80% that it's going to go to 100, but that can't go to 200. You know, it's much better to buy something on an asset basis that something could go really right with it and you can make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about, you know, Encore Wire, right? If that's cheap on a price to book or something at some point, well, in a short supply for the industry, it actually makes a ton of money and it has a strong position in not a good industry really. Or um, we talked about a mark precious metals, right? Or even if we talk about things like um, where people have low hopes of it being exploited anytime soon. So mm. Maui Land and Pineapple, right? It's all about, oh, is there a catalyst soon or not? So sometimes it trades at a big discount to what it might be worth because people are going, oh, I got to wait 10, 20 years. Or they're thinking this is going to happen in 10 or 20 months, you know? Mm. So there's a big possibility for a big payoff. A lot of times you're capping your upside on the asset things today. I don't think that was the case 50 years ago, but I think that that um, the upsides that I see are really small on things that are bought on the assets usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think if you're investing in, so you had mentioned Amark Precious Metals, Encore Wire, those are more cyclical industries, and if you're investing in them cheap on an asset basis, perhaps you're at the point in the cycle where they're starved for capital, maybe supplies coming out, you could hope that the cycle may, you know, the pendulum would swing back the other way, right? If you're buying it on a cheap to asset basis, you could sort of mm -hmm. have that, that, uh, tailwind, you know, when you're investing yeah, in that and situation. I, I don't look at current period earnings at all. Really. When I buy a stock, I'm saying, what will it earn in three years or something? I'm using like, what's the long-term sales what's the constant things that way. And then looking at kind of what that could mean. So you could be using book value, you could be using sales and then you're applying some sort of multiple to it. But I would have no hesitation to buy something that's in a period where it's making nothing. You know, uh, an insurance company that has made, had a, you know, a combined ratio below 100 for the last 20 years. And now it's a, a, a 101 this year, you know, um, or let's say 107 or something so that its investment stuff wouldn't offset the loss. So it actually reported a loss. It wouldn't bother me. I'd be happy to buy an insurance company making a loss. I, I bought other, I mean, I think I literally bought Nintendo when it, the one time it made a loss. Um, I, we talked about airlines. I'd be happy to buy Southwest when it made a loss. It wouldn't bother me. Uh huh. Is that because of the brand of Southwest? It's such a dominant business that's been around forever. They have mind shares, staying power. I mean, this is a company that, you know, is, is uh, a very high quality business. No, it's, it's like, would you look uh, at, would you think differently about 
that if it was a not a Southwest, if it was like a micro cap or a company that isn't yet proven or haven't been around, has not been around as long as Southwest has been. No, it's just trying to to not be stupid to use your mind here. There's no reason why having a 12 month period where something had a loss should matter. It just doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, C's Candies, I'm sure, reports losses for quarters during the year because it's a seasonal business. Um, you know, the question is, did it outperform all the other companies in that industry or something? It would be much more alarming if if a company, and we showed this with Southwest, over time, the major legacy carriers have closed the gap with Southwest. There's no doubt. That's the thing I'd be worried about. That happened even in years where Southwest had good margins and everything um so it's that relative advantage the same thing with insurers if you posted a 101 combined ratio when everyone else had a 93 in your industry yeah i'd be worried that something happened and hopefully it's a one-time event um but it wouldn't bother me if you were still keeping much of your relative advantage over others so it's it, you focus on the things that are you know i've said this before constant consequential and calculable so what are the things that i the calculable reason is because otherwise you just get people who write two pages of all the things that could happen with uncertainty and uncertainty isn't risk. Yes, there'll be problems. Every business is going to have a lot of problems yeah. and just saying them ahead of time doesn't help. We talked about a company. If you remember that we bought stock in that ha- had to do with loyalty points in airlines and we bought it before COVID. Yeah. We thought of some other things that happened that did happen during COVID. Yeah. <laughs> didn't help us. <laughs> COVID still happened. The airline still shut down. It doesn't matter if you said what would happen in a pandemic, what happened in war, you have to ultimately make a decision. Yeah. And are you just going to avoid anything that would be devastated in that kind of situation? So yeah, there's always lots of uncertainty and everything, but um, you have to look at the, the long-term value of the company. The, most stocks today, ba- basically all stocks are long, very long duration assets. The yeah. actual amount they earn this year and even pay out this year is is not highly consequential. Um, it just isn't usually enough to move the needle between a really good idea and a so-so one even. So it does not matter. Uh, I mean, even if you couldn't predict, as long as you knew that a company wanted, would have the same number of shares out and the balance sheet wouldn't look that much different in three years, it's not really that important that you know what they're going to earn this year or next year. Maybe it matters to the stock, but even then it's arguable because if the stock is so focused on short-term earnings that it moves ahead of those times, then it's also moving on guidance and on expectations for the industry. So it could move anyway for reasons that don't make sense to you. So it can still a stock can still work out really well for you in one to three years, even if you're just focused on what it looks like in year three or something. If I'm buying a stock in 2024, I'm really asking what's this going to look like in 2026? Because I don't want to be thinking, well, will there be a recession this year or not? While you own stocks or while the next person who buys it from you and decides what to pay for this owns this stock, there'll be recessions some years. There won't be in other years. It, whether there's a recession this year or something isn't something we should focus too much on, you know? So I, I don't think that current period earnings, either trailing 12 months or forward 12 months, is ever a particularly good idea to look at stocks. I don't think statistically it's ever been proven that that's helpful. Like the Schiller PE might have value. Price to sales might have value, but I don't think that PE would have value. That doesn't really make sense to me. How different does it feel to you investing? Like at least since we started focus compounding, valuations have been very high versus different parts in your career where you're buying FICO mm-hmm. at, you know, single digit PEs. There, investing has a lot of a fashion aspect to it, right? So it changes over time what people are really into. And it happens to be that the FICO type thing um, is really what everyone wants to be in right now. Um, They love the compounders. You know, we named our our, our whole everything that we do, Focus Compounding. Uh, I don't know if we were naming it today, we would do that. Because (laughs) although that word was out there a little bit, that is a word that now... If I go to Value Investors Club or something, they just designate something. This is a compounder as if that's like, that means something. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That is a category of stock. It, that's not really what happens. You know, it's a thing that happens to some. And um, I, I wouldn't put things in categories like that. I would say, look, most of the time does it do this or something is maybe a better way of thinking about it. Don't just put companies in boxes where you say this is a great company this is a compound or whatever but more often than not does it tend to be better at controlling expenses than other companies yes so that maybe sometimes is a better way to think of it yourself than this is a um you know uh cost cutter or this is a compound or whatever yeah um 
I mean, we've talked about over-the-counter markets. Is over-the-counter markets a compounder over time? Maybe. It's it's not a compounder that every year it's going to happen. I don't think it's a good idea to put it in that sort of category that way. I think it's better to think of it in in different terms. But, um, yeah, there's there's no doubt. The market is quite excited about these kinds of companies that grow a lot. And it's excited... Um, you know, you have NVIDIA up there. Uh, to me, that's hard to make any sense of that. That doesn't mean it... I don't know. Mathematically, we're getting to points where it pretty much does mean it, it can't make money over time from here. But, you know... I mean, I think... Let's take insiders. No insider ever buys NVIDIA stock, right? It's all sells, no buys. I believe that that's true. That if we looked at the last six months last year, it, there can't be anyone inside the company buying it. They have to all be selling. And that doesn't mean they're selling a lot or something, but I, I'm pretty sure it's like totally all one-sided. Um, and they're not wrong that they should turn a little of it into cash for themselves because what is the operating margin at NVIDIA in 2024? And this is not updated for the current, I mean, this probably is updated for the current quarter, but we're doing a trailing number here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 54%. Yeah, okay. Do you think the margin will be 54% in the future? I don't think do it. Does anyone think that? Is that what people think? Well, it, there's an issue because if something trades at 70 times earnings and the margins are twice what they're supposed to be, then you're actually trading at 150 times. I mean, what's likely to happen is that there will come a point where earnings don't grow as fast as revenue or to put it another way, earnings fall faster than revenue. And that may be a point where people are unhappy. Now they should notice that point beforehand, but it's not like you should look at revenue growth as being an accurate number of what's going to happen. I, I, um, you know, so that's the difficulty in doing these MPVs and all of that is that you can, but, but I do like them because you, if you just write down your assumptions about something, you do realize that, oh, you're assuming 50% operating margins, which is probably crazy. I mean, what's FICO's operating margins? Because NVIDIA is not going to be as good as FICO, but no. mm -hmm. the expectation is that it's going to be really close, about the same as the expectation right now, right? 43%. I mean, it's consistently gone better, but yeah, I mean, we're talking 10-year median margins on EBIT, 21.5%, but, you know, for operating margin, it's it's 26%, 31%, 39%, 42%. Yeah. I mean, VeriSign, I think, probably has margins that are a bit higher than that, probably. But, like, we, you could look at company after company, which is Moody's, you know, which are things where you have to, almost legally, you have to do this. For some companies, it's, it's not literally legally. But there are companies where, realistically, they kind of need to have FICO scores. There's alternatives. They could try to use them and stuff. But basically, you're going to need to use VeriSign, you know, indirectly. You're going to need to use FICO. You're going to need Moody's. You could do S&P and Fitch or something. But these are like taxes that are imposed upon you by monopoly type things, basically. They're kind of things that you do need. NVIDIA could have that position in a huge market. I just don't think that it'll ever have margins that are much higher than that. And that's why I'd say using things like sales. Mm -hmm. There's also a physical aspect to the NVIDIA thing where you actually will pile up inventory and everything. So... um. But look, I don't know. You're assuming that they, it grows very fast and that other people can't get into the business, right? Um, so I think the it's just something that I just don't worry about, you know? Uh, I don't just mean I don't worry about NVIDIA, but I don't worry about the fact that some companies have crazy multiples and does that mean the world's changed? We talked about it a little bit. I don't think it means it. It's just something that people are into now. And other points, they're really into value stuff or they're really into, you know, whatever else. Yeah, I, it comes I don't know cycles. that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that the exact multiple on some stocks is really all that more thought out than whether Bitcoin is the price it is or half the price it is, you know? There's an element that's thought about that way, but but you know Charlie Munger said that where he said you know that stocks are sometimes like Rembrandts you know to some extent, and I think that's true. Um, that I mean, Nvidia is simple in the way that why it's happening is that everyone wants to be in um, AI stuff, and they can only think of one name, and they only see one name in the press and everything. So it's the huge awareness. And that happens. But Barbenheimer happened. Why did it happen? Why did NVIDIA happen? I mean, it just was a thing. It was put in front of everybody. It caught their eye. They didn't know of other choices. They knew of that. And they bought that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's underlying reasons why NVIDIA is great, but I doubt that that's the only reason why the multiple is incredibly high because there have been great businesses in the past where the multiple for some reason isn't very high, you know? Um, but this is one where obviously you can't use either earnings. It, it fails that test is that mm-hmm. current earnings is too expensive on that basis. And then also it fails the test obviously on assets. So it's all about NPV. It's all about NPV. And, but we should keep in mind, and I don't want to discount this. Everything you know about a stock, a business, you know, is the past. All that matters about it is the future for you as investor today. The past does not matter. So we can look at that chart and see that in NVIDIA's past, it certainly has never performed as a business in any way that would justify this. The returns on capital here are off the charts, and they have 20-some years of history that is all consistently below that and quite cyclical and everything. It doesn't mean that it will return to being that because it could be quite a different business now. Um, So I, I don't want to just say you have to focus on those numbers and worry about it. I would never say the PE is too high, the price to book is too high, so I'm betting against it or something. Even when I said earlier in the year the uh, Magnificent Seven, you know, that is a group of stocks. And so I would say that if you wanted to, if you know, that if you're worried, and I don't think there is, I, I think you should just ignore it. But if you were worried that even if you buy stocks that are great, they're going to go down over time because everything's going to go down, you know, the only way to hedge that is basically the Magnificent Seven. Um, it's a realistic fear, I think, that even if you buy relatively good stocks, they they might still be absolutely not that cheap. But it's just something that we have to deal with. We, you know, especially managing money for other people, you kind of are putting the money to use in the best things that you can do. You try to make sure that you think it's double digit things, but um, you know, let's see from from 1999 to 2009, I would guess the inflation adjusted return in stocks was probably somewhat negative. I don't know if it was 1% or 2% negative or something, but like the real return was negative. Obviously, in Japan, it was negative for a long time. So, you know, it could happen, and that's just something that you have to accept. You, hopefully, you run on a, um, uh, you know, like a relative basis enough points ahead of the market that you still have a positive return. But, it, you know, it's not always that easy. I would just steer very clear of these sorts of things. I mean, what I would say is, like we've said, you know... It, you can have a very good success in life and in investing, never buying anything more than 10 times sales. So why add that to your thing to buy things that are 10 times sales or more? You can just ignore them. It's really not a big deal. Um, and the same thing is true with all sorts of other kinds of businesses. I think people do that with other things. They ignore entire categories if they're under litigation risk or something. They're just like, I won't buy it. Environmental things, I won't buy it. But if it's incredibly expensive, they they don't just say, okay, the company may be wonderful. I can learn about it, but no matter what, I'm not buying it over a certain multiple because that has a huge kind of catastrophic risk to it that I don't want to take. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If you have a question you would like featured on the podcast, email it to me, Andrew at FocusCompounding.com. I thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at FocusCompounding.com. And be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us here today. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support, and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.